I would much rather err on the side of excitement than I would on the side of boring. That's today's guest, legendary educator and author Peter Boonchaft, talking about the proper role of director energy. Welcome to Music Ed Insights. I'm leadership trainer and former band director Alan Fire, here with composer and co-college music education program head Steve Shanley. And for this intro, podcast insider Michael Pritchard. Each episode, Alan and I talk with national thought leaders in music education with practical insights for K-12 music educators. Michael, tell us about our guest. Called one of the most exciting and exhilarating voices in music education today, Dr. Peter Boonshaft has been invited to speak and conduct in every state in the nation and around the world. Dr. Boonshaft is the author of critically acclaimed best-selling books, co-author of Alfred Music's method book series, Sound Innovations, and recipient of countless awards. Find Peter's full bio, show notes, and resources at musicedinsights.com. Alan, what was the takeaway you had from this episode? I have a hard time choosing. I do have a bias toward all those practices that make rehearsals as effective as possible through consistency and careful planning. How about you, Steve? What do you think? Play easier repertoire. Boonshaft gives some great reasons for this, both artistic and educational. Yes, and I could have talked with him all day. He is such a force in our profession. This is an awesome episode. And all us insiders have had, and still have, access to an ad-free extended version since March. And I loved it. If you want the benefits of being a Music Ed Insights insider like me, head to musicedinsights.com to learn more. Thank you, Michael, for supporting us and supporting the program. For now, let's get to this episode with Dr. Peter Boonshaft. Peter Boonshaft, welcome to the program. Why, thank you. I so appreciate the invitation, Steve and Alan, to be here and to share with you. Well, we've asked you here today to help us energize our classrooms. I'm curious, what are some common problems you've encountered when it comes to a lack of energy in the classroom? Have you found some quick and easy fixes? And also, what are some fixes that might take us a little longer to implement? Well, it's a wonderful question, Steve, and one that we could probably spend hours and hours addressing. The one I believe is a kind of a simple one, and that is that there's no clear plan. When things seem very random, it's very hard to gather that energy and have it be that that forward moving uh, bullet train, if you will, of uh, success. Part of it is uh, having a clear schedule that outlines the work at hand for the day, and sharing that with the students as well for several reasons. One, so they know the pace of what's going to happen, but more importantly, so that when we accomplish these things, they can share in that feeling of, this is great, we got through every single thing we wanted to do, or we got through four of the five things we wanted to do. One thing that I think start right from the gate is that the room is neat and orderly, and that we start promptly, and that we hold them to that way of professionally working, because I think it sets a tone right from the get-go. I think one of the things that I often see as a problem is that what we ask the students to do isn't actionable. And I see it all the time. I'm guilty of it. It's where we use words that mean something to us, but don't translate to them so they know what to do. And very often, we as the teacher know why we're doing something. We give very clear instructions to do it, but the student can't do it because they don't know what the goal is or why they're even doing it. So things, for example, do it again is one of my favorite statements to hate. Yeah. Uh, it to me is an unactionable sentence. It doesn't. It's like telling me to grow hair. It just doesn't do any good for anybody. Uh, listen, when we listen, we said rehearsal. Okay, come on, we've got to listen. Start at the trio and listen this time. Concentrate. That is my favorite one where we look at a group and I'm guilty of it too and look at them and say, come on, just concentrate on that trumpet. Try harder. <laughs> hey, try harder. Yeah. 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 Those, those Make are it all, gooder. Yeah, that's right. Those are all sentiments that are really perfect for the teacher because they understand it, but they're not for the student. And it bogs down a rehearsal. It bogs down the energy and it makes it very difficult to have that momentum because the students feel like, why am I doing this? So I've always said that every sentence like that or every statement like that needs to have a colon at the end. Of it. Yeah. So we say, do it again at the trio. This time I need the trumpets to listen to the flutes because you're playing the same thing in octaves. So I, I really try to force myself that if I'm going to use any of those little fragments, that there's a colon to tell them why they're doing it. 
one of the things that I've always thought in my mind, and I remember back when I was a young student, variety seemed to always capture my attention. And sadly, the lack of variety in a rehearsal seemed to get me frustrated and took the shine off of the energy that was going. And I think that's one thing that we need to manage. It's that balance between routine that we need for structure and safety and comfort versus the variety that we need so that things are more exciting and that they don't bog down. Let's say a warm up that's really wonderful. Do it maybe a second time that week, but then leave it alone for three weeks. Don't do it again. A month, two months. Find something that will still accomplish that goal, but is a slightly different one. Uh, and other parts of that variety is the type of work we do in the rehearsal or the class. If you think of a, of a rehearsal, let's say of a band or an orchestra or a choir, some of the work is going to be sight reading. That's kind of clear cut. Some of the work is what I've always referred to as roughing in. It's where we're basically putting the structure together so that we, we can get from section to section. And within that section, it makes sense. It's recognizable as the piece. And then we can start to do the work of putting the artistry to it, so to speak, in some sense, and, and making it more musical and taking what we've roughed in and start to put the walls and the lighting and all of that. And then the last, which is the one we all live for as music teachers, is the polishing. And that's that part where we're being the most musical. We're asking our students to be the most musical. That's where the piece is in great shape. But now we can have those nuances of we just have a little bit of inflection here. And if the trumpets could come in a little softer here and then go with it. And we, we, we really act the way we would if we were dealing with professional musicians at that point in time. And obviously no one became a music teacher because we liked sight reading or we liked roughing in a piece. We did it for that last section. And I think that's the same thing for students. And one of the things I've always asked of myself and of students, and I think it, it works, is to do different types of work for variety within a rehearsal. So I force myself to do a little sight reading. I'll force myself to do some roughing in. And even in those initial rehearsals, I'll force myself to polish something. It might only be the last four measures of the piece, but I'm always doing some of those four types of work all the time in every rehearsal, because what I find is what I did and I didn't like, and I see many people do is the first few weeks is, is all sight reading. And then we spend months roughing in stuff yeah. and then yeah. a few months doing the other work. And then finally that last couple of weeks before the concert, that's when we go to get to do the polishing. So would one way to accomplish that be to, select different difficulty levels of pieces so that so you so one of them yeah maybe you're sight reading you know for the first day or two but you can really start to polish one of those things very quickly and that's part of the rehearsal while you rough out other absolutely alan i've always felt that one of the problems is we do music that's too difficult all the time yes uh, we always pick pieces that are at the, the edge of what the kids can comfortably do and I always think back to my dear friend, Francis Macbeth, who always said, if you can't have a group sight read a piece and it's recognizable at the sight read, the piece is too difficult for them to ever be able to work on it musically. Amen. <laughs> uh, in other words, in my language, we'd be chasing notes and rhythms all the way to the bitter end. Yeah. So part of it is having a piece, yes, that does challenge their technique and then have a piece, a couple of pieces that are right where they live, right? That's, that's perfect for them. And then a piece or two that's technically simple enough that we can then challenge them musically. We can challenge their heart and their soul, not just their fingers and their slides. When it comes to how we are in rehearsals is what I've referred to as the power of personality. You know, the students feed off of us, obviously. And, and if we don't have the energy, they're not going to have the energy. And I'm not saying everyone has to be happy, the clown on steroids. I'm not saying that we have to be a cheerleader all the time, but we have to have a strong enough personality that it comes through to the students that they know we're sincere, that we care, that we want to work hard, and we want them as part of that. And I think that power of personality, once developed, is the number one key to me of that energy that we want in a classroom or rehearsal. We've all seen teachers who are incredibly successful with a personality that's very quiet, very demure, very refined and elegant. We've seen teachers who are incredibly successful being just a bigger than life, so to speak, personality and everything in between. And my feeling is the more we can develop different ways with our students of having those moments of repose where we are kind of reflective and, and more sullen and quiet and other moments where we can jump up and down like that cheerleader. 
And that I think helps with the variety as well and, and helps to push that, that energy that we want. The inflection of how we say what we say is even more important sometimes than the words themselves. And then the body language of how we say it is to me sometimes the most important thing. And I think we have to be careful, I know I do, that our words, our inflection, our body language match and say the same thing because if they're incongruent, students are confused. And then likewise, we want to make sure that even when we're incredibly tired, when we've had that long week and it's Friday, last period rehearsal, that what doesn't end up being the casualty of that fatigue is the inflection body language aspect of what we're trying to help our students uh, get from us. I think the most important part of our body language and the one that I believe, and I have absolutely no proof of this other than just what I witness in myself and others, the first casualty to me of a teacher when they're frustrated, tired, upset, confused, is the face. And all too often I'll catch myself making a face in rehearsal that is not the least bit communicative, that is not the least bit helpful or positive in building the energy and power of the personality that I'm trying to, to create. And I don't think it's intentional. It's that the first thing when our brain is engaged, I believe, I know it's for me and for many of my students, when our brain is engaged with, okay, what's going on in the percussion section? I need to, I need to fix that. Or why do I hear a wrong note here? I went back and checked it twice, but I still hear a wrong note. Those kind of things. When we're, our brain is engaged profoundly, the first casualty is our face. How do you know that? Did you video yourself in rehearsals? Hours and hours and hours of videoing myself and then other conducting students of mine. Okay. I've actually suggested to people who have a problem with this, who struggle with this, I've actually had them make post-it notes where they'll put a facial expression or a word that'll jog their memory and put it in the piece, right in the score. And another thing that I think helps when it comes to the, the verbiage that we use with students is questioning. I had a student once, uh, I'm sorry, I had a, a, a colleague who, who came up to me once and said, you know, you ask a lot of questions in rehearsals. Doesn't that waste some time that you could use on something else? And my answer was no, because the questioning, number one, draws them more into what I'm doing. It also lets me assess them by nature of what they're asking. I can tell pretty well whether they understand the work at hand. And it also, I think, adds to that variety. Now, I'm not saying every minute of every rehearsal. But I think if we have leading questions that can really help students feel like they're contributing, they're part of it, and they're successful. Could you give us some examples of some of those questions you liked to ask? Sure. Percussion. Uh, when, when we start at the beginning of the piece, do you hear the accents? And, and they'll look at me and nod their heads and say, okay, do you hear the accents in the brass or do you hear your own accents? And they'll usually say our own. I said, okay, what I want you to do is play so soft right now that you hear the brass accents in the introduction. And then I want you to match them when we're doing this. I love that. I love how it goes back to what you said earlier, that instead of just saying, listen, and even just listen to the brass, you gave such a specific, listen to the accents in the brass. Like, and wow. then ask them to match that. And then I'll query them and say, first of all, did you hear it? And they'll nod, yes. Good, do you think you matched it? Yes. And then I'll try to go one step farther to make them be more creative. And I'll say, OK, now that the brass and the percussion have a unified accent, do you think it could be more or do you think it should be less or do you think we're right on? And there's no right answer to that, obviously. It's, you know, chocolate vanilla or strawberry ice cream, which is the best. But I want to draw them in. Now, again, we can't take time to do that all the time, but we can do it, I think, a little bit more often to drive, draw them in and ask questions. Going on to that next idea to me, and that is how important praise is. And by praising someone, let's say I look over and say, Susie, your posture is just absolutely wonderful today. Well, that release of dopamine in Susie's brain, that feel good chemical of, hey, I had success. He just praised me. That is addictive. And Susie wants to get more of that. So Susie's posture will be impeccable for the rest of that rehearsal. But what's amazing is people often say, but I can't do that for every student every minute of every rehearsal. And because dopamine is so addictive, we don't have to. Because if we think back to our psychology 001 class, there was constant reinforcement, which was a very good tool. But intermittent reinforcement was so much more powerful. And that's where I can look at Susie three weeks later and say, Susie, that posture, or just point to her back. And, and 
immediately that release of dopamine. And, and to me, it's having that addictive nature of dopamine, dopamine filter through our class student by student. And once we've won them all over with that, it really becomes that they're leading themselves more than I have to push them because they want it because they need that dopamine and they know what it, how good it feels. Now, I'm not saying that we have to be Pollyanna and say that everything's wonderful every time we drop the baton. It isn't. We have to be real with them. We have to be truthful and we have to let them know when things aren't good and why they're not good and what they can do to get better. But we also have to then positively reinforce those steps along that way. And that brings me to, to me, I think one of the biggest ones that our pace isn't appropriate. And I think the key is that variety, because I think they can burn out if it's just constantly fast, 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 fast pace. And I think we should experiment with different paces, ones that we're maybe not as comfortable with, and see if we can hone those skills as well. And so what I've always said is if our pace is fast and our instructions are clear and succinct, that saves enough time that then we can use the time to speak in ways that are really powerful, telling them a poem that matches the piece or talking about emotions or, or listening to two, two different examples. You know, Then we can use the time that way. So I think it's honing our speech to be meaningful. And I think that's a really important thing. And then another one that I, I love to point out to teachers is a, a wonderful bit of wisdom that I got from Imogene Hilliard, a wonderful teacher in Ohio. One of her bits of wisdom was, she said, remember that a child's attention span in minutes is equal to their chronological age in years. If we're dealing with sixth graders, we've got 11 minutes. And her wisdom was not that we have the first 11 minutes be great teaching and, and learning and great environment, and then the rest of it become nothing. It was that we intersperse those minutes throughout the time. So if we have a 40-minute rehearsal, we'll do two minutes of intense concentration, and then maybe some review, and then three minutes of intense concentration, and maybe a game. So we're constantly having the variety of that and interspersing because I'm convinced we can't change that number. How we manage it psychologically and pedagogically, I think, is what's really key. The last one that I would really kind of hold my hat on, so to speak, is that we need to review more often and make sure that some of that review is for what I've always referred to as guaranteed success. And that's this notion that we can play these eight measures so beautifully that it would make wallpaper start to cry. And then I can say, did you hear that? Did you know how beautiful that was? That was just gorgeous. Because I've always had one mantra, and that is that I believe that every child deserves to hear something beautiful every day of their life. And I think if we, their music teachers, don't help provide that, they may go days without that. And I think it's incumbent upon us to have those moments that are just breathtaking, no matter how difficult the work at hand might be, and where we can say, wow, that whole piece needs to be woodshed. That's fine. But every rehearsal needs to end. I believe it needs to start and have interspersed little moments of this guaranteed success because that's, to me, the motivation. They hear it and they feel it even more so. And they say, yep, it's worth learning that passage that I can't play yet because someday it's going to make me feel the way that little passage that I can play makes me feel. And also a good way to maintain the variety for sure. Absolutely. Well, in that attention span, that was another aha for me from this discussion yeah. where I think the conventional wisdom is very much, they only have so much in their tank for attention span, do what you want to do that's important at the very beginning of rehearsal. But this idea of, nah, you could spread it out. If they've got 10 minutes, then if you're really working them for three or four minutes and then you take a break on it, you can kind of bank those remaining six or seven minutes to use later. I think that is something that many of our listeners probably have not considered. I certainly hadn't prior to this conversation. Absolutely. So I think our music teachers often will learn, hey, dynamics are great, so we need to do more dynamics. And general effect is great. We need to have more general effect and, yes. and so forth and so forth. Is there a chance that we could have too much energy, that we take what you have taught us today and we're like, well, if this is good, then I'm going to double it. We're going to have a lot of it and I'll be the most amazing teacher ever. Where, where do you weigh on that? It's a great question. And my answer is kind of a non-answer is yes and no. I don't think one can possess too much energy. 
Alan is relieved to hear you say that. Yeah, I, oh, I, I, I'm so. Thanks for saying that on the record in front of Steve. <laughs> <laughs> Having lots of, I don't think there's a limit to how much energy we should possess in us. It's how we use it. Yeah. How it manifests itself in a class, and the answer, the 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 yes part of it is, when we get to the point where we're no longer fast paced and exciting, and it becomes frenetic, and it becomes unwieldy. It's almost like using a fire to make sure that we can clear this fire break that we need on this mountain. It's when we control it, it's a very good tool. When that fire gets out of control and takes out the, the mountain, then that's where it's gone too much. And I think I have without any question, and I'm sure any student who has worked with me will say, there are times that I start to speak so quickly in rehearsal that they can't understand. me. Heck, there are times when I speak so quickly, I can't understand me. So now I think Steve appreciates you putting that on the record in in front of me. (laughs) (laughs) But I will say it is rare for me to see examples when I go out and watch teachers for me to say, well, they really need to cool it with the energy. They need to hone that energy more. It's usually the opposite problem. I would much rather err on the side of excitement than I would on the side of boring. But I will say I've had very powerful teachers who could communicate the same things in a different manner. And I think that's what makes education so wonderful is that none of us are going to be the same as anyone else. And and that's the joy for a student is they get to have all those different personalities. So you've retired from your full-time teaching job a few years ago. Uh, Alan and I have been longtime fans of yours, of your writing and your clinics. And and we're curious, what, what are you doing now with your retirement? You have any cool projects you've been up to? Well, you know, retirement gave me an opportunity to be on the road full-time. It was a very hard decision to retire from the university, but this gave me the opportunity to do residencies at other universities and colleges. It gave me opportunity to do very long-term things where I would spend a week or two weeks in an area, which I couldn't do, obviously, when I was teaching. At the same time, I've been working on a couple of things that have been very, very enjoyable for me. When I became director of education for KHS America, Jupiter Band Instruments, they asked if I would do a blog. I'm like, I don't even know what a blog really is. And uh, they said, we really want you to try this. So I did it as an experiment. It comes out every Wednesday during the school year. It's a short little thing. It's absolutely free. There's no money changing hand of any kind. It's a dedicated website. No one gets calls, you know, hey, do you want to buy a car? It's nothing like that. It's just dedicated to this. And I just love it. And I've started doing it uh, those years back and I'm now addicted to it. I get more email about the blog than probably anything else in my life. And it's just fun. It's, It's little things where write this on the board and don't say anything. And it's a quote to put on the board or try this with your clarinets or the next time this happens, try this. And it's just little short, quick things that people can think about. And it's been great fun. It's just called Boonshaft's blog. And it's, uh, again, it's meant to be short little things, one cup of coffee's worth of things to think about or to try. uh, And that keeps me busy uh, doing that. But then I've just finished a project that I'm outrageously excited about. And that is a new book series called Sound Artistry. It's a book that I think is long time needed. And and the reason I'm so excited about it is, so we do a book one for our bands and orchestras. And let's say band in this case, we do our book one. And then some of us go on and do a book two. And then for most students, the next thing they work on would be Close for the clarinets or Arben for the trumpet or Tafanel and Gobert for the flutes, that conservatory method, if you will. But there's really nothing in between there. So what we end up doing is training our band students using band music to fill that gap from book two to those conservatory methods. And that is an enormous problem because if we don't do something in 9-8, they don't play in 9-8. If we don't do something that's in A major, they never play in A major. If we don't do something that requires double tonguing, they don't, or harmonics or anything else. So this book, Sound Artistry, is filling the gap from when they finished that to when they're ready for a conservatory method. And it's been really a neat journey. We've worked with a whole bunch of wonderful teachers, some of the finest studio teachers in the country, worked with Chris Bernitas and I to to structure these books. So it really is that missing link that I feel so strongly about. All right, well, thanks for joining us today, Peter. Can we close down with the lightning round on some lighter topics? I would love it, absolutely. All right, what's your favorite restaurant in New York City these days? Without question, it would be my favorite pizza restaurant in New York City. And it's a place called Don Antonio's. It is absolutely 
eye-opening. Uh, when you have pizza at Don Antonio's, you're pretty well spoiled from everything else. How about a piece of music, a composer, or a performer that you wish more people knew about? That, to me, is easy. On the top of my head, I can say it's Gary Carr, the renowned string bass player. He is a remarkable human being. He is an extraordinary performer. When I listen to Mr. Carr play on a recording, I feel things that I didn't even know I could. What he brings out is profound and powerful, enlightening, liberating. He's a joyful spirit, and his music is extraordinary. And I think not enough people have had the opportunity to listen to him. And so it would be Gary Carr, I think, for sure. How about your favorite vacation destination? That's a toughie, but I would have to say it would be Oporto in Portugal. I'm a big fan of port. And so going there is just fabulous. It's an old, old city that's a lot of climbing. I will warn your listeners, it's a lot of climbing, lots of steps everywhere you go, but it's a beautiful place. The people are wonderful. The food is amazing. The culture is fabulous. So I would think it's probably Oporto, though I love London and adore going there often. I, I would say it's Oporto in Portugal. All right. I imagine this might be the toughest. What's the most memorable live music performance you've attended? Because I bet you've had a few good ones over the years. <laughs> it's a fairly recent one, a performance of the BBC Symphony in London doing Mahler 7. And part of the reason was it was at the Barbican Concert Hall, which is a very intimate one. Their big hall there is a very intimate one. And we happened to be seated about, oh, I'm going to guess, 15 feet from the conductor. And the power of that piece with that wonderful orchestra playing it in that room I felt like they were playing it for me. I felt like I was literally on the podium. It took everything out of me. It was one of the most emotional pieces, uh, emotional performances of such an incredible piece to begin with. But I would say Mahler 7, BBC Symphony, Barbican Theatre, London. And finally, a book recommendation from Dr. Boonshaft for our listeners. Well, that depends on if we're thinking music or not music. If you've got a not music, we would take it. Easy. And that is the remarkable author, Leo Buscaglia, and it's his book entitled Love. Leo Buscaya was a remarkable gentleman, and he started his life uh, teaching and writing about uh, students with special needs. And he kind of went into this avenue of talking and, and teaching. He actually taught courses at the university level on, on what is love and how we can. And he wrote a series of books, many of them. I, I love them all. But I think love is, is the one that I would say by Leo Buscaya. Peter Boonshaft. My rehearsals changed the day after I heard you give a clinic nearly 20 years ago. Uh, so influential for me, and I know for so many others. We've been looking forward to this interview for a long, long time, and it has not disappointed. It's been awesome. Thank you so much for joining us today. My pleasure. Thank you, Alan. Thank you, Steve. And I hope our paths cross again very soon. Thanks for listening to Music Ed Insights. We're supported by Group Dynamic, a leading provider of youth leadership workshops. Alan works with dozens of schools each year to help develop their leaders. Learn more at groupdynamic.net slash youth hyphen leadership. Or you could email me at alan at groupdynamic.net. Also sponsored by the Co College Music Education Program. They've got a website too. Just click their link at our website or email me at shanley at coe.edu. Also, the normal design, helping normal companies and people create memorable, meaningful, and professional designs and branding. More at thenormaldesign.com. And Winterset Websites, website design and maintenance. WintersetWebsites.com. Our Facebook page is Music Ed Insights. Our website has program notes, links, and a one page download of this episode's key takeaways. That's Music Ed Insights.com. New episodes generally drop every couple weeks on Monday. Get current, stay relevant. Music Ed Insights. 